hello. I know I recognise a lot of faces here. It's really nice to see you all again. Basically, I've worked in mental health services for 30 odd years. I've used them for more than a quarter of a century and I've been trying to change the world for at least as long as that. So that's me. Um, don't worry about the doctor bit on that. It's a PhD in boredom. My PhD was called The Nature and Origins of Boredom. So you've been warned. I guess what I want to talk about is actually, I think, if we're going to make personalisation or recovery a reality for those of us who use mental health services, then we actually need a fundamental change of approach, fundamental change of culture throughout systems. And I suppose when I look at my years in mental health services, we fundamentally have see mental health problems as a clinical challenge. I've talked about cure care and containment. Try and get them better, look after them until they can, and keep the public safe while you're doing it. We think about treatment and cures, and most of the stuff on rights in mental health services has been about the right either to get treatment or the right to refuse it. We haven't really talked about citizenship rights. And I guess, for me, recovery approaches and personalisation actually start in a different place. I think... Where those two approaches come from is seeing mental health problems not as a clinical challenge, but a personal and social challenge. I guess what we've got to recognise is that to be diagnosed with a mental health condition is a pretty devastating and life-changing event. The kind of bottom falls out of your world. And you've basically got two choices, haven't you? You can either be a mad axe murderer, or you can be a poor incompetent who can't do anything for themselves. Either way, you've lost your ability to reason and have to have other people. I don't know, which would you prefer? Would you go for the mad axe murderer or the poor incompetent? I know I always err on the side of the, poor, the mad axe murderer because I couldn't bear being a poor incompetent, but never mind. I think often the biggest barriers that people face are actually what it means to have a mental health condition in our society. And fundamentally, that actually is assumed that we have lost our ability to reason. I think the challenge that we face in, for any of us with a mental health condition is rebuilding our lives. And that's what ideas about recovery are about. And I suppose... If you look at some of the books, these have been sort of encamped by professions. But if you look at the origin of ideas about recovery and mental health services, they actually derive from the American civil rights movement and the work of people like Judy Chamberlain. Has anyone read Judy Chamberlain on our own? Oh, good. The rest of, you, the rest of them must go and read it, mustn't they? It's still just as relevant today as, it, as it's always been. And I guess for me, recovery is that journey of finding meaning in what's happened, and I don't mean biopsychosocial models, getting a new sense of purpose, value in life, discovering and using your own resources, growing beyond what's happened. I used to work in rehabilitation services, and we all talked a lot about maintenance. I don't do maintenance, I do growth, and that goes on until you die, and some of you may believe it goes on after that. And I guess it's that essentially thing about building a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life. I am not talking about getting better. I'm talking about recovering a life, not recovering from an illness. It's not the same as cure. It's not about waiting for the storm to be over. It's about learning to dance in the rain. It's not about fixing what's broken. It's about finding wholeness, meaning, and purpose. It's not a theory about the cause of mental health problems. I don't really care whether you think mental health problems derive from wonky neurotransmitters, brain chemicals, whether you think it's all those psychological processes that me and my kind have invented, you know, your id's egos, superegos and dysfunctional cognitions, or whether you think it's about social ills or the action of various deity. It doesn't matter what got you into this position, the reality is that everyone faces the challenge of recovering a life. And most importantly, it's not a professional intervention. Mental health services can't recover people. What they can do is provide a fertile ground in which we can grow or fail to provide that, which I suspect is most people's experience. No formula for recovery. This is where you have to be careful of psychologists. We're very good at inventing stages of things. We did it with bereavement. We did it with addictions, didn't we? Pre-contemplative and God knows what. We've done it with recovery. 
Fortunately, the social anthropologists came and saved us and found that we didn't obey the stages. People just don't. But it does appear that there are three things that are critical in recovery. One is hope. You can't rebuild your life unless you believe it's possible. The second is control. I'm not talking about choice here. Because choice for me in mental health services is often meant choice of what we choose to offer you. You know, you can either have a day centre or assertive outreach. Have any of you ever woken up with a burning need for assertive outreach? <laughs> I haven't. I guess that being in control of your own destiny, in control of your own life, and in control of the support you receive to live it. And it's about opportunity, the chance to do the things you value, the chance to do the things that any citizen should expect. And I guess there's obvious fits there with personalisation, aren't there? Less obvious fits with some of our traditional approaches in mental health services. I very much see recovery and personalisation actually being part of a shared vision. They're both rooted in lived experience. They weren't something that was invented by the expert professionals. They came out of people's real lives. I think the second is they both have the goal of equal citizenship. They both move beyond cure, care, containment and seeing, to actually thinking about rebuilding lives. Challenge the mental health system to see people as pe people rather than patients. To think about people and their lives rather than their psychiatric career. Go and have a look at a set of notes. You'll find pages and pages on people's psychiatric becoming and their psychiatric career. What about our lives? I think the next thing is they really do require us to rebalance the ideas about treatment. Now, I've got no objection to treatment, but I think we have to stop thinking about does treatment get rid of problems and start thinking about does treatment get you a life? Does clozapine get you a job? Does CBT get you a partner? Does OT get you a job, I get, get you a life? I just think it's something about how we actually evaluate those very differently. So I think, actually, there are three elements to the fundamental change in culture and approach that we need. First of all, it's redefining why we're here. What is the purpose of a mental health service? Is it to get rid of problems, or is it to help people get lives? I think the second thing is actually changing the balance of power. I'm sorry, I don't do empowerment. That's the psychological version of power. I think what we're talking about is really changing the balance of power within services. Um, very much about how mental health professionals of all hues, social care professionals, are on tap there when we need them, rather than on top determining what we do. That's what Churchill said of scientists. We need their expertise, but for God's sake, don't let them run the country. We need all these expert psychologists and things, but for God's sake, don't let them run people's lives. I think... The final thing is actually creating communities that can actually accommodate all of us, that business about equal citizenship. Have we made any progress? Well, I've been around for a long time, and we're in a very different place from those old long-stay institutions. And we've got all sorts of things now. We've got recovery indicators and recovery strategies. I've written a few myself. We've got recovery training. We've got peer support workers. We've got recovery colleges. But I am really worried because I'm really scared that both recovery and personalisation in the hands of very powerful professionals who are very good at turning things into part of their own game. So I see still recovery is about getting better. How many people can you discharge? How many people have you recovered today? I also see those little adoptions. So we've got recovery models. You know, you can have medical models, psychological models, and recovery models, just like all the rest. And then, of course, we have recovery interventions. You've got to do a recovery star, and then you're done. We've got recovery teams. And then we've got recovery workers. All that kind of encampment of ideas and changing them into your own. I don't really think that the balance of power has changed. I think we've very clearly got the idea that the expert knows best. And of course, we allow choice and control when you agree with the expert. If you don't agree with the expert, you lack insight. 
And that lacking of insight is, of course, a symptom of mental disorder. So other people have got to decide for you. We've got the whole language around. You do know, actually, the definition of insight is agreeing with the experts, don't you? I, so it is. Go and have a look. Go have a look. I guess we've also seen, at the same time as all these ideas about personalisation, all these ideas about recovery, we've actually seen the ultimate use of power increase horribly. One of the things that frightens me to death is what we're doing with compulsory detention. We invented CTOs, which don't work. Have you seen the paper? But we thought those would stop people having to come into the hospital. Hospital. You know, if we forced people to do things in the community, then we'd be all right. Hasn't worked. We've seen a huge increase in CTOs and we've seen a huge increase in number of people we detain in hospital. This is really a primary emergency. I can't... But no, where are the people talking about it much now? You know, we did our opposition to the Mental Health Act and this is what we're doing to people now. For me, actually, recovery and personalisation require a different model for understanding the challenge. And I think, if we think about it, there's two ways of promoting inclusion and citizenship, aren't there? You can either change people so they fit in, or you can change the world so it accommodates people. In health, mental health services, we are really good at trying to change people to fit in. We psychologise them, we nurse them, we occupational therapise them, we psychiatrise them in order to help them to fit in. I'm actually going to suggest that we have a lot to learn from a broader disability movement and that what we need to do is replace that clinical framework of changing people to actually a social model and a human rights framework. God, that sounds a bit radical for the NHS, doesn't it? I think if we look at some of the writers from a disability movement, what Mike Oliver would argue is that actually it's society that disables people. It's not some intrinsic thing about my bipolar disorder that disables me. Actually, it's the society. It's the assumptions, the structures, the barriers that are imposed on you. And I suppose what we're talking about when we talk about a social model is actually focusing on the economic, environmental, cultural barriers that prevent participation. And you know, it isn't actually new. In this country, we were a bit slow coming to it in the mental health arena, but actually Pat Deegan in 1992 said, actually this all makes sense. Having a psychiatric disability is for many of us simply a given. The real problems exist in the form of barriers in, in the environment that prevent us living, working and learning in environments of our choice. That sounds rather like personalisation, doesn't it? 1992 that was. And I guess I think we've got to actually recognise that it's that social model that gives us our positive rights in society. All of the equalities legislation, which includes us, actually is predicated on that kind of a social model. We've got the Equality Act, the pre previous roadmap, an independent living strategy. Now we've got a disability strategy that's fulfilling potential coming out shortly. The UN Declaration on Human Rights. And the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People actually does talk about Article 19, the right to live independently and be included in your community. Now, in mental health services, we normally sort of say, all right, independence means leaving services. Independence means no longer leading, needing help. That is not what Article 19 says. Actually, what it says is the right to the assistance necessary to support living and inclusion in the community. And I think that's where we've got to get to. Independence, recovery is not about putting right what's wrong. It's actually about how we can enable people to access those opportunities that anybody else... and give, making sure people have the support to do that. So actually, I think it makes us ask different questions. Instead of starting from what's wrong with a person, and I could find in any of your notes great catalogues of what's wrong, deficits and dysfunctions, can't I? Even those of you who are doing strengths-based care planning. Couldn't we get rid of the term care planning? Just, just eliminate it, you know. Care, cotton wool... Actually, it's about supporting opportunities. I think instead of looking at what's wrong with people, what we need to do is look at what are the barriers that prevent participation and how can we help the person to get around them? How can we provide the support and adjustments that people need to get around those barriers? And I think it requires us to think very differently about independent living, not ceasing to need help, but about 
all disabled people having the same choice and control and freedom as any other citizen, at home, at work, and as members of the community. This doesn't mean disabled people doing everything for themselves, but it does mean that any practical assistance people need should be based on their own choices and aspirations. And I think that's what recovery and personalisation are about. And actually, that is government policy. I'm not quite sure that health and social services have caught up with that yet. But unless we do, unless we actually have that shift in thinking, I think we're going to have great difficulty in promoting recovery or enabling people to take control over their lives. I'm going to shut up now. Do that, don't you?